Okay, uh, so we have been looking at uh, reasoning and we have looked at power chaining in first order logic. Uh, Let us come back to representation a little bit and see how we can actually represent the things that we want to represent. So, we are still focusing on FOL for server logic. Let us uh, start by looking at something that we have not done so much, uh, which is the existential quantifier. We have looked at the universal quantifier and we have seen that most of the rules that we express are universally quantified in a sense that all men are mortal and things like that. But to for the sake of completeness, we also need existential quantifiers and we will see that there are certain things you can say using only the existential quantifier. So, let us look at that a little bit. So, if you remember uh, the quantifier symbol is like an inverted E followed by a variable name and followed by some predicate. The predicate may have other arguments, but it does not matter for simplicity we will just talk of P of x. So, what this is saying is that there exists an x such that P of x is true essentially. P is a predicate, some predicate. Remember that unary predicates are subsets of the domain and so on essentially. So, for example, we might say something like uh, there exists an x even x. So, if you if you if our universe of discourse is a set of numbers, then we are making a statement that there exists an even number essentially and so on. Hmm. Now, one thing about the existentially quantified statement is that it is a strong statement in the sense that we are asserting that there is at least one element which satisfies the predicate essentially, whatever the predicate is essentially. Now, if you remember the universally quantified statements. Uh, so, if you said uh, for all x, let us say P x implies Q x, then if you remember the semantics. So, this is something we must keep in mind when we talk about representation that the semantics of first order logic that we are uh, dealing with is basically set theoretic in nature and that uh, unary predicates stand for subsets of the domain, uh, binary predicate stands for relations between elements of the domain and higher order predicates likewise are relations and so on essentially. So, everything every predicate can be interpreted as a as a subset of of some either of the domain or, or a cross product of the domain of certain arity. So, if you remember uh, the meaning of this statement is that there is a subset of the domain which satisfies the property Q and what the given statement is asserting is that inside this set Q there is a set which is P. So, what we are essentially saying is that if anything is a P, then it is a Q essentially. So, for example, if, if anything is mortal man, then that thing is mortal essentially or all students are bright if I say, if anything anyone is a student, then anyone is bright. So, that, that was the meaning of that essentially. When we talk about an existentially quantified statements, so, so, so this basically stood for all P's are Q. What if you want to talk about some P's are Q? So, the moment we say some, we need to use the existential quantifier. So, we are saying that there exists at least one element in the domain which is a P and which is also a Q essentially. 
So, before we do that, uh, before we express that, can we just replicate? So, let me put a question mark here. So, can we simply write there exists x p x implies q x. And the answer to that is no actually. Hmm. So, the, if you want to represent this statement, then this is not a correct way of representing thing. And one way of testing whether your representation is consistent is to try and look at the negation of a statement I think. Hmm. So, look at the negation. So, what is the negation of some p's or q? Its negation is that. So, what are we saying when we are saying some p's or q? We are saying that there is some element which is a p as well as which is a q. So, now we want to say that there is no element which is both p and q at the same time essentially. Hmm. Now, if you were to negate this formula. Then we basically put a negation sign in front of this. Then, if you remember the rules of uh, first order logic, the rules of substitution, we can push the negation inside. So, this will become for all x p x implies q x. So, if you remember we can rewrite this as not p x or q x, which we can rewrite as by again pushing the not inside. The De Morgan's law will apply, the all will get converted into an and. So, the negation of the, the logic statement which says that there exists an x p x implies q x, the negation of that is for all x p x and not q x. So, if you read this to what is this statement saying? This is saying that everything is a p p and not a q. So, let us take an example. If I wanted to say that some students are bright, what this is giving us a negation of that is first of all saying that everything everybody is a student or everything is a student and that student is not bright. So, obviously, that is not a correct way of uh, uh, representing things. So, this uh, representation that we talked about is wrong essentially. So, what is the right representation? The correct way to do it is to write it as there exists an x, p x and q x. Hmm. Which if you were to look at the, the, the semantics of this statement, essentially what you are saying is that there is a set p and there is another set q and there is at least one element which belongs to both the sets or the intersection of those sets is non empty and this statement is essentially saying that that there is at least one element which is both p x and q x essentially. So, let us negate this one just to try out whether this is this gives us something more meaningful. So, if we negate this we again put a negation sign uh, there exists an x p x and q x, which when you push the negation inside will become for all x not p x and q x, which we if you push it further in will become for all x not p x or not q x. 
and which we if you put it further in okay before we do that you can see that this statement corresponds to what we are trying to say when we say that some p's are q we said there exists an x px and qx the negation of that is that for all x it's not true that px and qx which is the which is the literal negation of the expression that we had essentially but we can continue to rewrite this as follows for all x So, what is this one saying? It, this last statement is saying that for all x, if x is a p, it cannot be q essentially, or it is not a q essentially, which is why we can see that uh, this representation is the correct representation for, for the statement some p's are q. Now, let us go to the process of implicit quantifier notation. So, remember uh, so for a universally quantified variable, if you have something like for all x, we said that we will replace it with a question mark followed by x. What do we do for existentially quantified statement? So, for existentially quantified statement, it turns out that the process is not so straightforward. So, let us look at it uh, in a step by step. Uh, let us take a simple formula. This says, for example, if you are talking about numbers, so there exists an n, even n. We are saying that there exists a number which is an even number. Now, what we do is to scolomize this, we say okay, we know that there is at least a number. Remember that the existential statement is strong in the sense of existence essentially, as opposed to the universally quantified statement. So, just to uh, go back to that point, uh, if we said that if we have this set P, which is inside this set Q, and we say for all x, p x implies q x. Then, if the set p were to be empty, then also this statement is true essentially. Hmm? So, I, if I had said something like uh, all black apples are let us say pink, obviously a, a somewhat pointless statement, but what we are trying to say is that a statement like this is true. if there are no black apples. Or if the set on the left hand side is empty. So, a universally quantified statement may talk about such things all black apples are pink, uh, all honest politicians are bright all that kind of stuff essentially. If, 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 if the element that we are talking about does not exist, then the statement is still true essentially. Whereas, if we had a statement like some politicians 
are honest. It's a stronger statement because this one asserts existence of an honest politician, which means that this statement will be true only if there is at least one politician who is honest in his view. So, of course, luckily for us nowadays we can say that this statement is true, but it is a stronger statement. It makes, makes a assertion that there must be at least one element essentially. So, what we do in converting this into implicit quantifier form is to say that okay, we will give it a name. So, we will call this uh, some name and what do we mean by that? That we introduce a new constant. So, instead of saying there exists an n even n, we will say even uh, let us say even n. where this is a constant. <coughs> and so, if we had this statement, uh, some pol politicians are honest, uh, we would in implicit quantifier form write it as, uh, let us say P stands for politician uh, and let us say, um, I use this term S k 11 and honest S k 11, where S k 11 is some con constant essentially. Hmm. So, the important thing is that you must introduce a new constant name, it must not coincide with uh, some existing name or something and it must be a new constant name and for that reason we also call it as a Skolem constant and this process of converting into implicit quantifier form including for universal quantifiers, uh, we call it as this process we call it as skolemization. And this is uh, after a logician by the name of Skolem, Skolem Skolem essentially. So, this process of converting to implicit quantifier form is called Skolemization after Skolem. And the simplest case is when we have a simple existentially quantified statement like there exists a even number or there exists a honest politician, then we simply say that okay, there is a uh, constant name we will introduce and which is different from our language so far, it does not occur in the language and essentially we are saying that that is a that is the element we are talking about essentially. So, let us now look at slightly more complex cases. These cases occur when the existential quantifier comes in the scope of a universal quantifier essentially. So, let me begin by an example. So, supposing I make this statement every boy loves a girl. We want to express this in first order logic and then we want to scolomize it essentially. So, when we want to express it in first order logic, the first question is what do we mean by this statement essentially. Hmm? Now, there could possibly be two interpretations of this statement. One could be that there is a girl which every boy loves 
and the other could be that for every boy there is some girl that the boy loves. Okay. So, one way of doing this would be to say that there exists g such that if, if capital G stands for a girl so that g is a girl and for all b boy b implies loves let us say l stands for this thing So, this, this is saying that there is one girl who everybody loves essentially and if you want to scolomize this, we just replace g with a constant. So, let us call it s k g in honor of scolum and replace b with a variable So, you must look at the meaning of this statement. The meaning of this statement is that okay, there is some girl, we do not know who that girl is. So, we are identifying it by a scolum constant which is s k g and for every boy that boy loves this girl essentially. An alternate way of saying this is that the girl that the boy loves is specific to that boy essentially, which is possibly the more normal form of this meaning essentially. So, this we can write as the following that for all b, boy b implies there exists g such that g is a girl and loves boy. So, as an exercise you must go back and take the negation of both these statements that we have and see whether the negations are meaningful or not. You know that is a way of testing whether your representation is correct or not. But now let us talk about scolomizing this. Now, this is in the scope of for all b. So, this when we say there exists a girl we are not talking about any girl now essentially, we are talking about that girl who this particular for that, that boy loves essentially. Okay. So, in some sense g is dependent upon b, because the girl that we are talking about will depend on which is the boy that we are talking about. So, so, so one boy may love girl A, another boy may girl love B and so on and so forth. So, those girls are not some arbitrary girls, but they are dependent upon the which we say are scolum functions. Of B. So, just as we introduce scolum constants, we introduce scolum functions and then we uh, replace this by as before uh, the variable b is a universally quantified variable. So, it will be like earlier, but this girl is now a scolum function. So, let us say uh, s k l of b. So, we are saying that there is some scolum function s k l which when applied to b points to remember that that functions return terms to us essentially. So, every function denotes a term essentially. So, this fun scolum function also denotes a term and it denotes that particular term which this particular boy b loves essentially. So, that is a key idea that we are following here that this is a scolum function of B essentially. So, likewise uh, another example if I had said that uh, for all n there exists a number m such that m greater than n. 
Hmm. Forget about whether this statement is true or not, it will probably depend upon the domain that you are working with, but the statement says that for every number there exists a smaller number essentially. Hmm. Notice that I have, I have used the mathematical notation for greater than, I could have written something like uh, g t m n, but since we are so familiar with mathematical notation, we can continue to use that sort of a notation. So, what is the rule for scholomization? That if there is a set of and inside the scope of this there is an exists uh, p for example, then this p must be replaced by a scolum function of all the universally quantified variables in whose scope it comes essentially. So, this p will be replaced by some scolum function let us call it s k 3 of x y Scolum function of all variables. So, actually, I should say all universally quantified variables. in the scope of which p falls. The rest of the matching unification rules apply as before. So, let us take an example. So, supposing I say that there exists an x e 1 x and for all x e 1 x implies not odd x. So, from this you should be able to infer that there exists an x not odd x. I will leave this as a small exercise for you to do that scolomize these statements and see that you can still apply the modus ponens. It is a straightforward process because x will be replaced by question mark x and uh, in the in the in the second case in the first case it will be re replaced by some constant and, and then it will become easy essentially. Likewise, you should be able to show something like this that for example, if you say all x there exists a y loves x y and if you say for all x for all y loves x y <coughs> implies cares for x y. You should be able to infer that for all x there exists a y such that cares for x y. You can just try the scolarization process and, and show that uh, it can be done. Okay, I want to end with one last thing in scolarization, which is how do you identify the nature of a variable. In the sense 
that we know that how to quantify universally quantified variables, we know how to quantify existentially quantified variables. So, why did we know that is a universally quantified variable or an existentially quantified variable? So, to illustrate that, let me state an example here. Supposing I say it is not the case that How do you read this statement? That it is not the case that that exists an x such that x is not mortal essentially, hmm, that x is immortal. Now, is x a universally quantified variable or existentially quantified variable? It is universally quantified variable. Why do you say that? Because the sign there says there exists an x. It is indeed a universally quantified variable because this is equivalent to saying for all x negation of mortal x, which is equivalent to saying is that for all x mortal x. So, this reveals the true nature of this uh, variable that is a universally quantified variable and the way to do that is to push the, the negation sign inside. Because you know that when a negation <coughs> sign is showing up outside a quantifier, when it is pushed inside it will change the nature of the quanti quantifier essentially. So, if I had a statement like this that if there exists a black apple for example, then let us say the earth is flat, which I could write as follows. Uh, there exists B such that let us say B stands for black apple or B A B implies flat earth. There is only one variable which is B in this. Is B universal or existential? It is a little bit trickier. Uh, so, let me just quickly rewrite this. Uh, we can rewrite this as not there exists B, B A B or F B, which we can rewrite as by pushing the not inside for all B, not B A B or F B and there is nothing to stop me from putting an extra pair of brackets here, which means pulling the universal quantifier out including F E in the scope of the universal quantifier, which is which does not create a problem because that does not have the variable x essentially. And once I do that you can see that this is stating that for all B, B A B implies So, the point that I am trying to make here is that whenever we have a combination like this. So, this if contains a hidden negation hmm, as you can see here. And therefore, you whenever a you existential quantifier occurs in the antecedent of a implication statement, you must treat it as a universally quantified statement again. Essentially. Okay, so I'll stop here. Uh, in the next class, we will try to see uh, how we express relations between different kinds of categories and 
things like that in personal or logic too.